kinds of changes that I have no idea whether or not these are legitimate. And I go and check, and IT is not putting in any tickets for any of this stuff. And uh, so I'm like, well, why don't you just go tell the IT folks, you know, or your manager or whatever, we need to start doing some better change control in the subset the system. And he's like, yeah, well, I don't think they'll do anything, but you can tell them. You're the consultant. They'll listen to you, right? And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? I'm here for like a week, and I'm the guy that's going to make this change that needs to happen. So that's kind of some of the background for this talk. Unfortunately, that happens all the time. So let's talk a little bit about um, hacking management. So this is um, just an overview of who I am. So I'm a consultant at Fertivity, going to help companies with a lot of stuff, um, hunting for hackers, doing some malware versioning. Um, the changer of things I like to say, because I like to get it and make things happen. So for this, for this talk, we'll talk first a little bit about what the problem space is, and then these three steps that I laid out that I think provide a pretty decent framework for most of us in IT security to think about how do you get a change from idea to actually happening. So let's talk about the problem space. So in terms of the overall problem, what I hear a lot of is you know, people just don't get it. Right, the security guy is like, oh, management doesn't get it. My organization doesn't get security. Um, I hear a lot of frustration sometimes from those people. Of they're fighting the good fight internally. They're just not getting anywhere. Then there's a group of people that are just afraid that people won't like them and that they're kind of been, they've been demonized on the team. It's like, oh, that's the policeman. I see security. He's going to come in here and ruin our product, right? Um, and there's also this concept of learned helplessness. Is anyone familiar with that concept? Okay, so. It's this idea in psychology where, and they did some not so nice experiments on dogs. They weren't like that bad, but they weren't nice. Um, but essentially, if you try to do something, um, like you try to, say, say somebody put a pancake on your head, right? You tried to bat it off, and that didn't work. And you tried a few different things, or you tried to slam there, and it still stayed there. No matter what you did, the condition didn't change. You start to feel helpless about your situation, and you start to learn that whatever you do doesn't really change the outcome. So from an IT security perspective, I've seen this where, in, in, in reality, when there's something you can't change, you don't do anything about it. And so I've seen cases where people are so used to not getting things done that they decide to not try to do anything, even when it could be very easy to get something done. So, so why is this the case? Why do we have this problem in security with getting, getting people to do the right thing? So there's obviously a cost element. There's no unlimited security budget, right? But I think more importantly, there's a lot of cases where people, like we're not really understanding how our organizations are structured and how decisions get made and how changes can happen. Um, and secondly, we're not doing as good a job as we could with empathizing with the people that need to make the decisions and seeing things from their, oops, from their perspective. And then we're also missing some key tactics for change. So there's some small things that I think we could do to improve our chances. So what's the solution, right? So we're, we're hackers, we hack. Um, how can we approach this that way? So the solution is, let's, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, one, doing some recon, right? Like an any pen test, recon the environment. Two, find the bones, or let's, let's call this empathy, right? Or empathize with folks. And then three, actually do the exploit. But in this case, we'll talk about it as we're going to enable change. And the reason why I did these strike throughs is, you know, I've, I've given this talk a few times, and. I don't want us to think about this purely from a hacking perspective because I think it's a very short-term view and it can miss the point. And a lot of you are familiar with the concept of social engineering. This isn't social engineering. I think if you try to do the social engineering route exclusively, you're going to end up burning some bridges when people figure things out. So I'd really like, encourage you to think about this as empathizing with people and as enabling change rather than trying to get in and social engineer them. So let's talk about recon. So recon is all about knowing what and who is going to impact your change, right? So what, what's, what's out there? And so there's the formal structure side of things. So what is the official structure? There's a chain of command that goes on in your organization, right? Your boss reports to somebody who reports to somebody. There's also maybe committees that you may or may not be aware of that are responsible for those decisions. So your boss may want to do something, but he has to get buy-in from this other committee. Um, and then there's budget approval processes. And that's not just your own boss's budget approval process, but there's organizational-wide dependencies. So this budget goes into that budget, which then goes on this budget cycle. So there's a lot of complexity here that it's important to understand if you're going to start trying to get a change through what that background is. So as part of your recon, getting a good sense of this. Then there's, of course, the unofficial structure. So who's liked in the organization? 
right? Who seems to be a pretty popular person? Um, who are some trusted advisors or influencers? So maybe you know, even though it's not in the official chain of command, the CIO really respects the opinion of this project manager. So if you got that project manager to buy into your idea, things would go more smoothly. And, like, and then there's a social aspect. So just who has beers with you? So when you're doing your recon in your organization, trying to get a sense of this will help make your, increase the chances of your change being successful. And then, of course, there's the environment that your company's in. So there's the financial side. Is your company doing really well financially, in which case asking for money is not a big a deal as it could be? Or are things going really poorly, in which case you really are going to have an uphill struggle asking for additional dollars? Um, are there new products or initiatives coming out? If everyone's gearing towards this Q3 launch of this big, huge new thing, maybe it's better that you try your, your idea in Q4 instead of in Q3. Um, are there new regulations going on? So if you kept abreast of what's going on in the regulatory environment, things that you can maybe uh, help your cause, you could point to and say, hey, did you see this new guidance that came out that said that we should be doing this? My idea supports that guidance in these ways. And then, of course, there's things like news of breaches that can happen. So these are things that are outside of your environment that you should stay on top of because it's going to impact how successful your team is going to be. So secondly is empathizing. So empathizing is really about getting into the heads of the decision makers, understanding what makes them tick. And so from that perspective, when you're thinking about, you've mapped out the chain of command, you picked a person. So in that person, what is their, their factual background? So what's their work history? What, what did they get um, their education? What groups are they a part of? So I'll help you understand their perspective and who they are and figure out where they're coming from on this. The next is motivation. So does anyone know who this fine gentleman is? Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice, that's right, the lyrical poet. Um, could be somebody's role model, right? So it's important to understand who are the role models involved, um, what do people, who do people look up to, um, what's this person's bonus structure, right? That's a very personal thing, but it should be available. To, that type of knowledge you can find out in the organization. Are they bonus based on they need to complete these four projects in fiscal year 2015? Or is it their bonus based on the amount of budget reduction they do? By understanding these things, you can help under, uh, learn about their motivation. Um, also, career ambitions. So is this somebody that's just kind of happy where they are, they don't want to rock the boat, they don't want to make any waves? Or is this somebody that's really going after that next position, and they want something, maybe your idea, they can, they can latch on to you to show that they're being proactive? Um, and then finally, any existing really present challenges or priorities? So what's on their plate for this year? What are some things that management has come to them with to say, we need to do this this year? And then there's some hopes and dreams or um, fears and dreams. So this is the idea of, you know, we have Dr. Freud up here. Um, this is getting into some more fundamental emotional things, but you know, what, keeps, what keeps this person up at night? You know, what are they afraid of? What's their worst nightmare? And conversely, what would make them a hero? What's going to put that, make them look really good to their peers? Um, and are they the type of person that tends to make decisions more based out of fear or based out of hope, right? So is this, when they're making decisions about things, are you going to position this more on, this is going to reduce the risk of this bad thing occurring, or this is going to enable us to do all these new things? And people make decisions in different manners depending on the situation, but it's important you have a sense of this so that you can um, leverage it in your communication. Um, so how do they make decisions is another one. Right, so what is their approach? Based on what you've seen in the past, what is their approach to making decisions? Are they more of an emotional decision maker where they come out of the RFP process and they're like, yeah, but you know, I really like that guy, you know, that SE or that person I really trusted in. Um, or are they more logical? Like, well, I looked at the feature set and did this spreadsheet matrix and put these multipliers and this is the outcome, right? I have an, an asterisk by the logical because Nobody's purely logical in their decision-making process. But if this person thinks they're logical, that's what matters. And so when it comes time to persuade them and provide them with information, you want to provide them with more of that factual basis. Next is, are they big picture versus details? Are they going to get quickly bored if you start enumerating through the 15 different ways this would be helpful? Or are they looking for one simple statement? Um, and also, how do they communicate? So are they visual? Are they more physical? So do this, does this person say things like, do you see what I'm saying all the time? Or do you hear what I'm saying? Or are they saying like, um, we need to stay grounded. 
you know, they're constantly making actions like this. That can give you clues into the type of communicator they are. So when you go to communicate your idea to them, if they're a visual person, it makes sense to do it in a visual manner. So last step, so enabling change. So you've looked at your organization overall, you've done your recon, you've you know, learned about the people involved in the decision-making process so you can emphasize, emphasize, emphasize with them. This is all about what's it going to take to make the change happen. So there are three main things you think about here. First is, you're going to need to work the system for a lot of changes, unless it's a simple change. So this means that you're going to have to go up in the hierarchy, you're going to have to go down, talk to your peers. They sometimes call this socializing your idea. So it's not just about your boss usually, it's usually about this ecosystem and your boss is going to ask these people for opinions and these people will be involved in this way. So it's about socializing your idea through all those groups. It's also about adaptation. So you don't want to be um, so stuck in exactly how your idea is going to be executed that you aren't prepared to adapt. Your idea will probably not happen exactly as you planned. So you need to learn to say, it's okay, I have 80% of what I want, 20% of what I don't want, but this thing's still going to happen overall. So be conscious that you need to adapt as you go through this process. And then you also need to be persistent. You know, a lot of people, I would say, give up too soon, especially when you're talking about things like budget cycles and funding. If you miss the budget window for that year, and there's no good exception process, no spare budget, it may be another year before your change can get implemented. You just have to be persistent and wait through it. A lot of these changes, some of them may even take years, so you can't expect that you're going to go in and get something done you know, in one week or a month. And also riding waves and views. So this is one that I think we miss out on too often by kind of downplaying the news. So you know we'll see big headlines like you know, Sony massively hacked and oh my god they're going to go bankrupt and then someone on Twitter is like nobody's ever gotten you know their stock price increases after they get hacked and like oh, you hear all these counter arguments which are perhaps factual but in the context of wanting a change to happen you can ride these news waves to support your idea. So you don't want to be the person that's constantly missing that opportunity because you want to downplay everything. In some cases, you may want to ride along with that. So, does anyone know who uh, this, this guy is here? Julie Idol, that's right. I, just, I thought this picture is pretty interesting. It's like, he's either claw me or hit me. It's a full of surprises. Um, so, features versus benefits. So, when you're sharing, when you're communicating with people, um, you want to talk in terms of benefits to them. So, you may have an idea or a change um, that has a set of features. So an example, a web application firewall, right? You might have, oh, it handles this many transactions per second, it handles, you know, eight of the OWASP top ten, it has this, it has this, it has that. For the person that you're talking to, those are all features. That says nothing about how it's going to benefit them. So when you're framing your argument or your discussion with them, talk about it in terms of how it's going to change their life or improve, you know, uh, improve what they're doing. So things like, Oh, this is going to enable. This is going to reduce the number of times we have to do an emergency patch on something. So we have a compensating control for this. These types of vulnerabilities. Um, this is going to lower our overall cost if you look at it this way. So again, going back to those motivators, how can you put things in terms of benefits to them as opposed to thinking about just the technical features that this thing has? Also, speaking their language, which we talked about, if they're a visual person, speak to them in those terms. Um, and finally, incorporating their ideas. So this is a great technique that a lot of us miss out on, and that is, you know, people, when you talk to them, it's not a one-way street. They're going to come back with, hey, what if it, you know, can it do this, or what if we did that? And you should really look at those as opportunities and try to incorporate their idea, even if it's kind of crappy idea, may not be the best. Uh, if it's not going to change the overall thing, think about incorporating it, because then you've just changed something from your idea to their idea and your idea. Right? And so the more people that you engage with, you can kind of get their buy-in, their piece of it onto it. All of a sudden, it's all of your ideas instead of just one person. And finally, making action easy. So this is about, when it comes for the actual change, you want to be two steps ahead. So if you know, for example, um, that once you get approval from your boss, you need to go out and get a PO from this company, um, already have that lined up. You don't want to be in a position where it's hurry up and wait. So you try and try and try to get this thing done, and you're like, oh crap, we need to schedule a sizing uh, thing with the vendor, and that's going to take a month to schedule. So you want to try to be two steps ahead always. Um, another successful technique for making it easier is doing people's work for them. 
So if you know, for example, that your boss has to fill out this RFQ form and fill out this, you know, this change request or something like that, offer to do that on their behalf. Or if there's other stakeholders that have to do things, offer to pitch in and help with that. It makes it a lot easier to say yes if you know there's no additional work for you. And then the last one, which is a super powerful technique, is the idea of doing just a trial or a pilot. So for your idea, you know, if it's a big change, you may not be able to get people to bite off right off the bat, but what if it's not needing to sign off on you know, 300K worth of expense? What if it's, hey, let's try this in this one place, and if it works as well as we think it will, then we can roll it out everywhere else. So it just doesn't have to be a product. It can be an idea or a process or whatever. Try it small, it reduces the risk for them to say yes, and it makes it super easy. So, that was the overall presentation, and now my challenge to you guys is, you know, it's your turn as an information security professional to go through, and, and I would hope that after this, you might try picking one change, going back to your organization, pick one thing, big or small, and try some of these steps and see how it goes. So try doing some recon, figuring out who the, you know, what the players are in your organization, informal structures, the current environment, Try the empathizing exercises, trying to get a better sense of what motivates people, and then try some of these uh, steps that I indicated to make action easier. So, that was it. Any questions? Comments? Well, there I am on Twitter. Started building these IoT devices, having the same problem. Like, why don't we just make an app that can look at 